And now we are here. Brendan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, we just talked about it. I know you're a busy individual, so I appreciate your time. Oh, man, no problem, man. Thanks for having me, bro. Uh, of course, you're always welcome. I had Ryan Hollins on. I've done a couple Instagram lives uh-huh. with you. I'm like, oh, it's only time to have you on. So no telling what no telling what lies Ryan was up here saying, man. Hot take Hollins. <laughs> I think I instigated it a little bit with you guys about the injuries. I was like, I remember I walked into the conversation and it was like the difference between a torn ACL or there was something going on. And I remember I just asked one question and you guys went at it. I'm like, I probably instigated that one a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do though. We like brothers. We always arguing about something. Yes, sir. I love it. Um, First off, I want to say you've done such a tremendous job in your transition that I don't think you get enough credit for. A lot of broadcasters do. I don't think people understand how hard it is to do what you do. So from being an NBA player, it is so hard to just be that, to be so just good at one thing. But to be able to have such a seamless transition and be good at another um, career field, I don't think you guys get enough flowers for what you do, what Perkins does, what Ryan Hollins does. So first off, you do tremendous work. I mean, I definitely appreciate that, man. And, you know, uh, I, I love my job. It's a great job. I get to talk about games that I was going to watch anyway. And I've always just had a love for basketball. So I've always thought about basketball from an analytical standpoint. So this just seems natural to me. It seems like a natural fit. Yeah, you, you, you do awesome work. You may need to tilt your camera a tad up. I got – looks like it cut off your eyes a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. There you go. Uh, let me see. Perfect. Perfect. There, there. You're looking. Dark. Um, but yeah, you, you do tremendous work. And uh, this this one looks this this looks weird. Technology. Perfect. You good? Yeah, hold on. Speaker view. Okay. Does that look good? Yeah, you look sharp. That's one thing I've had to master is Skype. Uh, okay. obviously pandemics, so all these interviews I do now are through Skype. Um, but yeah, you do awesome work. And so the first thing I wanted to talk about is how big of a difference have you noticed this career for your other, obviously it's a different industry, but has it changed your perspective viewing it from the outside in instead of being a player within it? Like, are you noticing some things maybe you didn't notice before by watching and covering all these games? Yeah, I think when you're, um, <clears throat> when you're in the media, you definitely see some things differently than when you were a player. Um, and so I always have to take that into mind when I'm doing my work. Uh, I, I want to think about both sides. But yeah, it's different in the media because sometimes you have to talk about something and you might not have all of the facts. A story might break and you got to talk about that story that day. You have to give an opinion that day. And it might be deeper than what you originally know or the original information you get. So you have to be able to walk that line where you're still being yourself, you're doing good work and you're hitting the hottest topics, but not forgetting what it is to be a player and be on the other side. Right. And now do you feel you have that responsibility to be the voice of the players, but yet you're obviously in the media game. So you're still representing almost both parties in a way. Yeah, I definitely feel like players in general um, have that responsibility. I think that's something a lot of guys have lost, has lost, have lost sight of is that, there's enough people that are going to tear the players down. And I'm not saying you protect players at all costs. I'm not saying that if a guy has a bad game, you say he has a bad game. But there's a difference between actively making fun of somebody as opposed to say, doing your job, saying the guy didn't play well or he has to step up. You know, I think that's the difference. If you're a player and a guy goes 0 for 10, hey, you got to talk about that. Now, if you're right. out there, if you're out there clowning, clowning them like the rest of Twitter is or the people on some of these other sports shows, I think that's where we have to step back as players and realize we have to be different because if we don't treat our brothers different. Why would anybody else in the media treat them differently? Right. And I think people forget. I know it seems like Twitter and Instagram have been around forever, but this is somewhat new. Not all generations had Instagram oh, yeah. Twitter, especially back in the day. So I think we're still learning um, as a community on how to deal with that. And I think you've, I've noticed the past couple of years, we're starting to understand, okay, so people used to do this for ratings and clicks. And like you said, tear down players, but I think there's been this need of, or this want of, okay, this isn't acceptable anymore. We don't want to watch guys use their platform to tear down others. Uh, you know what? I think some guy, I think it's still popular guys using really? their platform. Yeah. I mean, if you look at some of the most successful talk shows or, or the morning shows, you know, it's, it sells controversy. It sells, you know, hot takes, things that might not necessarily be true, things that might necessarily um, or, or might just be a little bit funny at somebody else's expense. That's what's popping right now. 
You yeah. know, some of the some of the best people that that's what that's what they do. Yeah, that's true. I, I just don't think it, it's not in me personally. I don't like tearing down others. Like I just feel it's especially if I'm not in the act of doing it. Who am I to judge a guy playing on the court? I can't even get on that court. So who yeah. am I to say, oh, this guy's a terrible person? Like that's just not me to tear. It comes off corny to me to tear down another human being. Yeah, but you're one of the few. Like if you look at a lot of other people, like when they, hey, if a guy has a bad game, they talk about how they might say he's terrible, he's trash, whatever he is. Like they have a whole list of jokes to go along with them. And you're thinking to yourself, at least I am like, dude, you couldn't have got out there and gotten that guy's shoes. And on the right. flip side, he has a way better chance of doing your job than you have of doing his. So it's just, it's a fine line. And um, right. you just have to understand how to walk that line. And then a lot of the older players is another, it's, a, it's another gap because the older players that never were on social media, never had to deal with that. They don't understand the pressure that goes along with that. They don't understand the 24 hour news cycle that they never had. So they think right. some of these guys are soft and I'm like, nah, you guys would have been just as, um, you guys would have been just as sensitive if it was you because now people can talk trash to you or reach out and touch you all day long. And that's something different to deal with. Right. And that's actually something I've talked about. Could you imagine if like a Muhammad Ali had social media or if like a Michael Jordan had social media, Ooh. Dennis Rodman had social media? It's like they would be so polarizing because they already were without the social media. Like we think Conor McGregor's polarizing. Could you imagine Muhammad Ali at the height of his career having Twitter and Instagram? Like it would be like you change the world. Yeah, it definitely would. Somebody like Muhammad Ali with his voice, Michael Jordan, with his popularity. Those guys, like with social media, it would, it would, things, would, things would go through the roof. But with that popularity and fame, there's a flip side. There's a negative side. Right. If you don't play well, it's just all the backlash. Like, look how great mm -hmm. LeBron James has been for so long. But he has a bad game. It's, man, social media can't wait to attack him. Um, right. we're, we're, see, we're seeing that now present day with Paul George. Man, people can't wait for Paul George. To, I think fans a lot of times on Twitter are praying Paul George has a bad game. So yeah. Go out there and get their jokes off about pandemic P. So we're in a totally different time. And that's one thing that I think some of the older players, they don't get. They just think that right. these guys are, are they being sensitive? I'm like, nah, y'all don't understand. It's a lot different than in the 90s and 80s. Right. And that's why I love what you do. Uh, I see you're always doing great work with Grant Hill. I love Grant Hill um, and the work that he's done. Ryan Hollins, uh, Kendrick Perkins, the list goes on and on. Um, but I do want to ask you this. So obviously you're incredibly knowledgeable with the game. So, Brendan, before we dive into specifics, I want to take a macro view on something. At the end of the day, this is the storytelling business. It's all about talk. And what are we talking about? That's what the NBA is. The NFL may be the most watched. The NBA is the most talked about. What is your story from this season? What do you take away from this season? To me, it's not the injuries. To me, I think we're going to look back at 2021 and say we just officially flipped the page to the new wave and the new generation of players. What is your story for the 2021 NBA season? I think it's both. You can't flip the page to the new wave without the injuries because the injuries kind of right. paved the way. So let's look at somebody like Giannis, who's already been great. Now, but he's still a younger player in this league. Do we think that the Bucs would have beat the Brooklyn Nets if Kyrie or James Harden were healthy? Not both of them, just one of them. We right. probably, probably not. So we would have been telling a different story. Uh, um, do we think that Philly might have won that series had Embiid not been playing on a torn MCL the whole series? Um, who knows? So the injuries definitely cleared the way. Even somebody like Devin Booker, who has been playing incredible along with Chris Paul, they were the, they've been the healthiest team all playoffs. They've also been the most fortunate. Right. They get, they get the Lakers. LeBron's coming off a high ankle sprain. Anthony Davis can't finish the series. Um, in the second round, Jamal Murray isn't, isn't available. In the conference finals, Kawhi Leonard can't play. So we can't tell the story of these younger guys like Devin Booker, Trey Young, um, and all these guys stepping up into these new roles without also talking about the injuries to the old guard that opened the door. That's very true. That is a very great point. And now, do you think this is – how do you explain that? So for someone who um, played in the NBA, professional athlete at the highest level – how do you explain these injuries? Now, do you say, yeah, it's exactly what LeBron said. You have a short and off season, obviously a condensed schedule, more back to backs, more travel. Is it like, how do you, what is the explanation for the amount of injuries that we've had this season to the best players in the world? Oh, the easiest way to put it is fatigue. Okay. And so what happens is when you don't have this, the regular time in the off season, you don't have as much time for your body to rest. You also don't have as much time to rev your body up or prepare 
for the incoming season. So what normally happens is guys, when they get put out the playoffs, take a couple weeks off, chill with the fam. Then they slowly, but they then they slowly but surely start ramping things back up, getting getting shots up, weights, whatever they want to work on their weaknesses in their game. And then throughout the summer, then they start playing pickup, running sprints, doing things of that nature. Then they get ready to go to camp. Well, when you have a, a shortened season, you don't get that. So you get guys that somebody like Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis didn't look like he did much in the offseason because he didn't look like himself. He looked heavier. And this is not the Anthony Davis I'm used to seeing. So he right. comes into a season. And, yeah, he cooled down from the championship, but he never got to rev back up, which is why we saw Anthony Davis look the way he did. And that type of thing leads to injuries over time because your body is not used to getting the same type of proper rest because you're back in a, in a really, really quick turnaround. So I right. think fatigue overall is like, hey, people say, well, these injuries are freak injuries. They can happen. Well, a lot of it is like, hey, man, that that muscle or that ligament's really tired from the schedule. And next thing you know, boom, it gets hit. So instead of it being a little bit stable, it's a little bit tired and you give and you got an MCL tear or sprain or whatever it is. So all those things come into play. But I think uh, LeBron James is no fool. I think he, he called this one correctly. And when the guys look back, they're going to realize they probably should have followed this league. Right. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk to you about this. So one thing I said last year, I predicted the Lakers to win it last year. I did predict them to win it this year. Obviously talk about injuries that, definitely uh, affected that result. Um, but I, t- I said the Lakers were the first team since the 2008 Boston Celtics that went from not making the playoffs the year prior to winning a championship the following year. They completely skipped, oh, you make the playoffs, then you get bounced, you get, you get a little further, you advance a little further. They just went straight to championship, and then right. the 2020 Lakers just did it. The Phoenix Suns are doing the same exact thing. Obviously, they played in the bubble for those eight games, but they went from not making the playoffs to now in the finals, and I have them defeating the Milwaukee Bucks. Right. How impressive is that to make that big of a jump? I know we t- CP3 was my MVP, and I talk about Wi-Fi DNA, how he connects to certain players a certain way, but how do you explain— CP3 was not the MVP. You stop it. Come on. Now, listen— <laughs> I think uh, well, we'll get into that, but do you, how do you ex- – obviously, Coach Monty Williams deserves his flowers as well. How do you explain the jump that they've done to just go straight to the NBA Finals? I think it, a lot of it comes down to um, their front office. So it starts with James Jones making excellent decisions as far as draft picks, um, coaching hires, and surrounding uh, this team with good veterans. So James Jones has done an excellent job because, hey, he hired Monty Williams to help set the culture. And Monty Williams has done an excellent job of that. Right. He brought he, he drafted Cam Johnson. Hey, listen, a lot of people thought that was hey, picking Cam Johnson, a, a 22. I think he's like a 23 year old spot up shooter at North Carolina at the number 11 pick. That was controversial at the time. I remember doing the draft for NBA TV and he's a Carolina guy. And I'm like, I love Cam Johnson. I'm not sure if I would take him at 11. You know, right. that's that's just that's just not where he was slotted to go. So James Jones had to do some things that were controversial, even trading for Chris Paul at his age. A lot of people felt, well, how much wear does this guy have on the tire? Like, does his timeline match up with Devin Booker's? Devin Booker's 24, Chris Paul's 34. Like, how is this going to work? Um, mm-hmm. But James Jones has pushed all the right buttons. Has That's why he was the executive of the year this year. And um, Chris Paul being the leader that he is, he has come in here and helped lead this team. Guys have followed him along with other great leaders on that team like Jay Crowder. And they're in this situation because um, they have great leadership. They have great foundation. And then they have something else that you kind of need in the playoffs. They have a little bit of luck. They mm-hmm. They – in the in the in the Western Conference, we already talked about this. They were able to take on three straight opponents that either their best player or their second best player was hurt or compromised or didn't even play at all in that series. And sometimes that happens. That that you just got to be lucky, man. Right. Now let me ask you this: How many like going into next season? I know we're not even done with this finals, but I'm just projecting a little bit here. Going into next season, how many teams are in the position that Phoenix was? Where, like, maybe they're one guy away, one veteran away, maybe a couple role players away from making this massive leap. Is there any team that's on the brink that Phoenix was that we saw last year to the bubble to now the NBA Finals? Uh, Yeah, some of them are teams that we already know. A team like the Golden State Warriors. You know, Klay Thompson comes back. They have some high draft picks that they can play around with. They've already been linked to some um, high-value trade guys. See it in a team like the Golden State Warriors go from losing in the playing game to possibly being a top tier seed in the Western Conference and making a run. I think wouldn't shock anybody. You know, like right. it, it, you get Wiseman back, you get you got Clay, you got Steph, and then you bring in either another high draft pick or you trade that pick for a good veteran. This team is right back rolling. So I think a team like Golden State makes sense um, to make that jump. 
Um, another team is uh, another obvious team to me would be Atlanta. We saw them in the well, they they they've already made a jump, but yeah. I think that now with the young players they have, maybe they could possibly package two guys together and go get another star. I think Trey Young needs another star to go with them so they can truly be championship level when a team like the Nets is full strength. So uh, those teams make make a lot of sense to me. I'm trying to think last but not least. Last but not least could be a team. I'll give you, say what? Would Dallas be there? Possibly. Dallas could be there possibly with free agency, and I'll give you a dark horse would be the New York Knicks. Mm. Because the New York Knicks, they have set, like, we have Thibodeau setting the culture. They have some good young guys that are fitting in, playing good defense. They have the money. They have some cap space. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not giving no names out, but I know there have been a couple of uh, couple of guys on other teams that are considered superstars that, that wouldn't mind teaming up in New York. So they're, they're, my, dark, they're my dark horse. They're my dark horse. That, that would be interesting. Like you said, culture is everything. That's one yeah. thing. I, the culture is absolutely everything, and they've set that. Um, let me ask you this. Let's act like you're James Jones. What is – what do you – well, actually, let's not even act like you're James Jones. Let's act like you're Chris Paul because he'll have an option. What is the market like for Chris Paul? What are you doing following this year? Because before, like, I felt like people didn't really maybe appreciate his value. Maybe the wear and tear is getting a little bit older, but obviously – it's like that championship hangover. People will overpay. People are overvalued. Look at Del Vadova um, and the contract he got after. I don't he won do my it. man Delhi like that. I played with Delhi for a year. Don't yeah, do Delhi like that. that. I'm just saying, like, there's players after you win a championship where you're able to have a bigger market than maybe you once were. Now, Chris Paul is obviously an all-time great, but what is the market like for him? And if you're Chris Paul, what do you do? Do you stay in a great situation in Phoenix that you have going with D Book and the great coaching staff, or do you explore some different options? If I'm, if I was Chris Paul, I would be staying in Phoenix. Because I have a great coaching staff, a great front office. I have two young studs when I talk about Booker and DeAndre Ayton. And as I get older and I'm Chris Paul and I'm able and I have to do less because Father Time is knocking on my door, I got two young guys that can pick up the slack. Ayton's right. getting better, Booker's getting better. So for me, if I was Chris Paul, um, he, he obviously is going to opt out. Um, but hey, I would make sure I get my money. I think his market, you know, what, what's the market for a team that, that you help make a championship level team? So I'm right. going to be coming for forty million dollars a year, and over over maybe a a three year span. So let's we let's let's talk about three years, one twenty, and I would stay in Phoenix. Right. No, that makes the most sense. And you have such young talent. DeAndre Ayton's popped, and the way he's been able to just play basketball is insane. Um, now talk about Giannis. I want your perspective on this. I've told Ryan when I had him on, I'm like, Giannis needs to play more off the ball. Like he's obviously more dominant in the paint. Whenever they run pick and roll, he's more. They make the play uh, the defense play honestly. What type of conversation? And like you said, now let's act like Brooklyn was healthy. It's almost like they're right. one loss away from we're having a completely different discussion about this. If, if Katie wore a size 15 instead of a <laughs> size 17, <laughs> Milwaukee would be at home right now. So, <laughs> OK, and my point. So we're having a completely different discussion. I don't even know if uh, Boonholzer would be the head coach. We're talking about what are we doing with? Yeah. What are we doing with Giannis? So if you're Giannis, what do you think the ingredient is for him to build this longevity, this success? Do you think he does need to switch and play more in the paint, more at the center position? If I was Milwaukee's GM, I would sit Giannis down. And I would give him some truth. I'd be like, hey, you, your offensive skills aren't good enough for our offense to play the way it does with you at the top of the key. We're still going to get you the ball because you're a stud. You're phenomenal. You're right. basically a hybrid center in today's offense. In today's offense, you're you're the new school version of Shaq. Y'all don't look the same, but as far as what you guys do, you dominate the paint. The paint is your area. The paint is your playground. So I'm going to tell Giannis, listen, instead of uh, you dribbling at the top of the key, when you get a rebound, you can push it in transition. Cool. If you get a layup, we'll take it. If not, kick the ball to Holiday or Middleton and right. set those guys a screen. Teams do not want to come off of his body because he catches lobs or activates the weak side for those corner threes to Brooke Lopez and Connaughton. So I say, hey, I want you to be a screener, a roller. If they switch the screen, we're going to drop it to you, punish those little guys, and then we're going to call plays for you from 15 feet on in. Cross screens. They're actually doing some of that now, but just simple cross screens and pin downs for you to catch the ball at the elbows and boxes. Until you prove that we can take your game beyond the three-point line, let's keep that thing 17 feet on in and let you dominate in there like you've been doing. Right. Now, before I, I get to this last point with you, because I appreciate your time, what are your thoughts on this series? Obviously, it's 2-1 right now. 
Milwaukee, I think next game is going to determine the series. That's just my opinion. I think Phoenix comes out and they, I think they understand that obviously a veteran like Chris Paul understands that. And I think Phoenix wins next game and ultimately wins the series. How do you see this series uh, playing out? I still think Phoenix wins the series because when, when times get tough in close games, I prefer Booker and Chris Paul over Middleton and Giannis in close games. And we know where there's going to be some close right. games coming down the stretch of this series, whether that's whether that means the series goes five, six, or seven, there's going to be some close games. And when it's winning time, I trust Booker and Chris Paul to make free throws and make jump shots, whereas Giannis sometimes in those moments, he can have a great game but might not finish it mm. the, the, in the way that those guys can finish games. So I still like Phoenix to win this series. Not sure what's going to happen in game four. Um I just know that Devin Booker has to play better. DeAndre Ayton has to stay out of foul trouble. And if that happens, Phoenix has a very good chance to win game four. But we shall see. Right. Lastly, I want to ask you this. So uh, Rashad Phillips is my guy. He's like he's like my family. He's my mentor. And I what, know he's your guy when you start talking about Wi-Fi DNA. I was like, oh, that's Rashad. That's Rashad no, all day. No, listen, so he created magnetism. I came up with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So originally oh. the way I came up with this. Oh, he was, stole your joint then. Listen, check this out. Check this out. I love them. So I said, the reason I came up with this, I love analogies. I've done Marvel comparisons, rap, rapper, rap artist, NBA players. So I said, okay, LeBron and Jordan, you're never going to convince the other person if you think the other one's greater. So I said, LeBron is Bluetooth. He connects with every device, wherever he goes, any player, doesn't matter. Michael Jordan's Wi-Fi. He doesn't connect with everybody because he's so competitive. He's very confrontational. But when he connects with you, it's a stronger connection. So I said, Chris Paul is like that. He didn't really connect well with DeAndre Jordan and Blake Griffin. But if he does connect with you, because he can be confrontational, he can get in your face, it's a stronger connection. So I said, Chris Paul has Wi-Fi DNA, and he connected with D-Book and Aiton. And I said that on our draft show last year when we were on SUV TV. Um, but I bring this up to you as this. So Trey Young, he put me on Trey Young. So we'd cover the Orlando Magic together. I talk with Trey. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm all in on Trey. So when I look at the best players, like under 25 in the list that have come out, if you had to pick one player to rock with for this point going on, I said I would go with Trey Young. Now, it doesn't mean Luka may not be better. Luka may be the face. But I just think Rashad's term magnetism, I think more people are going to want to play with Trey. Obviously, you got the Atlanta um, demographic, which a lot of the younger players would want to go to with music and fashion and sports. I like the front office. I like the coach. Trey Young would be my pick. So I'm asking you, Brennan, what young player would you rock with from this point on? I would go with Luka. I will okay. go with I will go with Luca just because I understand everything. And that's no diss to Trey Young. Trey right, Young, right. Yeah. So it's not like you know, like you know, in, in this sports where a lot of times when you pick another guy, you, they feel like you got to slam the person right. that you're going against. No, it's all love for Trey. I would just pick Luca based on the history of the game. Look okay. at the history of bat. Like so, if you look at basketball from the '80s, '90s, and 2000s, how many times has a point guard been the best player on a championship level team? Very seldom. It's like Isaiah Thomas and Curry. I, Isaiah Thomas and Steph Curry. Yeah. So, and you look at Steph Curry, they had an incredible run. They were like in front of everybody with this small ball, ball mover type thing. They were in front of everybody. And even then, after their team started catching up a little bit, the very next year, they lose to Cleveland. So I'm going to go with the guy with size because when you talk about, excuse me, the playoffs, guys with size that can handle the ball are movable chess pieces. And right. so what I mean by that is when Trey Young is cooking, He's cooking at the top of the key, or he's just driving down the lane. Whereas with a guy like Luca, he can cook at the top of the key. He can drive down the lane. He can pass just as good as Trey. But then if you have him with the right coach or the right system, you know what? They're trying to double Luke at the top of the key. Let's play him on the block. They're trying to play him with smaller players. Hey, let, let's, let's, let's post him up at the free throw line. Um, you know, like, let's let him get to his area and just pull up. Like when you have those bigger guys that can do the things that the small guys can do, History has shown you that's the better track record to bet on. So for me, it's not the fact that I love Luca that much more than Trey, or I think that Trey's way lower than Luca, like the, how they try to make it seem on draft night. I'm just looking at the history of the game, and I'm going to bet on what I think is more of a sure thing. Guys with size between the height of 6'5 to 6'10, 6'11 that do multiple things on and off the ball, those are the guys that traditionally win. Look at the who have been yeah. the finals MVPs probably for the last decade lebron Kawhi, kd twice back to back to lebron back to Kawhi. 
Then before that, who do you who do you have? You got Dirk, Paul Pierce, Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Wade. You see a trend? All yep. these guys have that height because what happens in the playoffs? Times get tough. You take on a good defensive team, and you can't just depend on step back threes. Now it's like, well, what are you going to do? Well, we got to post this guy up real quick, take advantage mm. of the mismatch in the fourth quarter. Hey, we got to get to the mid post and have him just be able to pull up and fade away over somebody and create a problem. Right. That's where a guy like Luca has an advantage over Trey. And I know Rashad's going to hate me for saying that because he, <laughs> we argue all the time. Like I've never actually met Rashad personally. We like show each other love and then argue on Twitter all the time. I love all of his work, but I yeah. know he's going to, I know he's going <laughs> to ride for Trey and I'm going to ride with Luke on this one. Even though, I, even though I respect Trey a lot and I love what he does. And I think that he proved that he's a top 10 player in this league. Well, if you ever come to Orlando, you got to uh, link up with me and Shad sometime. Man, listen, I come to Orlando. Dinner is on me. Dinner is on me. Let's make it happen. They got a lot of nice restaurants here in Orlando. Before I let you go, did you watch the Connor fight? No, nah, I didn't watch the fight. Did see the highlight, though, but I didn't, I didn't okay. watch the fight. Okay. All I'm right. More of a boxing, I'm more of a boxing guy. So you got Fury or Wilder? We know that fight's canceled right now. Yeah, the COVID outbreak, right? But I, I, I got Fury. I, I mean, Wilder... Like, if you watch that last fight, there's nothing that he can do with Fury. Fury is so much bigger than him, and he's a more skilled boxer. So he's going to lean on him, put his weight on him, and then Fury has the combos, the jabs, the footwork. Wilder has the power, but, you know, like, that's one shot. In boxing, one shot can end the fight, but I just think that Fury's uh, the bigger, more technical fighter. Brandon, you are awesome. So let me know whenever you come to Orlando. I appreciate you coming on the show. and uh, Appreciate it. Hey, and the Joker is the real MVP. Don't you Come stop on. that. Don't, stop. don't end on that note. Don't end stop on that. Stop that. The Joker is the real MVP, man. Y'all stop. <laughs> Y'all stop with that false narrative, man. All right, man. Be safe. Thank you. All right. Thank you.